Thank you all for coming. I'm Joseph Capizzi, the Executive Director of the Institute for Human Ecology here at Catholic University of America. At the IHE, as we refer to ourselves, we focus on the conditions that conduce to human flourishing, and we try to build out programs around that and attract interesting people into our orbit. Among the most interesting people we have attracted into our orbit is Matthew Walter, the editor of The Lamp, which brings us all together tonight. It's my pleasure um, to have Matthew here with us this evening. He's going to talk to us um, and engage um, some panelists on the issue of the Catholic imagination, and I believe he has a position on this that he will unveil in a few moments. I want to thank everyone online for joining us as well. Unfortunately, since you're online, you cannot share the drinks that we have here or the food. Um, and tonight we actually have alcohol, um, which, is, which is kind of nice. So those of you here in, uh, in person, do join us afterwards for the reception. Uh, we have whiskey and bourbon and other nice things to drink um, and also some things to eat. Matthew, again, will lead the conversation uh, after the panelists have done talking to each other, there will be an opportunity for Q&A, and we will bring around a microphone to you if you raise your hand. As always, uh, please ask a question. Don't give a speech. Uh, you know, there's an opportunity to talk to any of these people afterwards, but a nice, concise question is the way to go. Okay, thank you very much. Matthew, take it away. Thanks, Joe. Um, so once again, just uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm looking around for any cassocks. Have we got Reverend Fathers? That's usually part of my stock reading. Reverend Fathers, uh, for being here this evening uh, on the Feast of St. Edmund of Canterbury. And many thanks to the Institute of Human Ecology uh, at, here at uh, Seaway for hosting us. When Cardinal Manning was still an Anglican curate, he copied the habit from St. John Henry Newman and other members of the Oxford movement of dating his letters with the feasts or commemorations upon which uh, the letters were being written. Uh, St. John's devotion to obscure female Cornish saints invited a great deal of disdain from his fellows in those days. One gentleman of unflagging evangelical conviction denounced his fanatical panegyrics of virginity as profane and likely to corrupt the youth. The same gentleman even called poor Saint Bega preternaturally diseased. <laughs> anyway, uh, Manning's bishop, a committed low churchman, didn't go quite so far, but he insisted upon parroting the epistolary trend I've just mentioned by ending his letters with things like tithes do or the bishop's palace washing day. Um, not really exhibiting much of the Catholic imagination there. <laughs> but before we can get to trying to define this, I should introduce uh, my friends and fellow panelists here. Um, so I'm happy to be joined this evening by James Matthew Wilson, the uh, Cullen Foundation Chair in English Literature at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, where he founded the MFA program in creative writing. Uh, he's also the poet in residence for the Benedict the Sixteenth Institute, editor of Colosseum Books, and poetry editor of Modern Age magazine. He's published eleven books, including most recently, "The Strangeness of the Good." Um, joined also by Jane Clark Skull, a poet, essayist, and playwright. Her work has been featured on the BBC and in journals and magazines including the Hopkins Review, the New Ohio Review, the American Journal of Poetry, and of course, The Lamp. Last but not least, Jess Breed, who arrived just in time, uh, insists upon identifying himself as a former academic, uh, although he is a frequent contributor to The Lamp. Um, he was trained initially as a classicist and was the final student of the late Professor Philip, uh, Philip Ford. He was also the last ever PhD awarded in the Department of Neo-Latin at Cambridge. And also, perhaps most impressively, the only person who has ever thought to undertake a literal translation of, translation of lorem ipsum. <laughs> um, but as far as the Catholic imagination goes, 
It's an interesting phrase, right? Because it's one that we've all heard before. Um, it's popularized by a, a book um, written by Father Andrew Greeley that came out in 2000. And his exemplars include a number of undoubted masterpieces, Cologne Cathedral, Bernini, Mozart, despite his Freemasonry. <laughs> uh, but it also includes some dirty movies, like Breaking the Waves. I'm sure no one here has seen such a motion picture, especially not a good New York Catholic boy like you, Joe. <laughs> but um, without getting too much into the weeds, I, for now, because that's the point of the discussion, I would like to suggest at the outset that Greeley's idea of a distinctly Catholic aesthetics is a kind of category mistake, much like the Catholic novel, by which critics generally mean a handful of very dreary works from the middle of the last century, Jansenist in theology, dour, full of random grotesqueries. Um, but instead of rejecting wholesale the possibility of a distinctly Catholic literature, I'm going to do something very perverse and suggest that there have been some Catholic novels, and that one of the best is The History of the Nun or The Fair Vowbreaker by Afra Ben, who could reasonably, reasonably be described as the inventor of the novel. Um, I should say at the outset that The History of the Nun is dedicated to the Duchess of Mazarin, the, one of the mis many mistresses of Charles II, uh, in whose salon Champagne was first introduced to English society. So it already has that going for it. Um, but the fair vow breaker in question uh, is a young woman named Isabella, whose father is widowed uh, while she's young, and he enters the Society of Jesus. Near the beginning of the novel, as we're being introduced to the principal characters, Mrs. Ben discusses in a sort of discursory way the nature of vows, religious vows, those taken in marriage, and rehearses details of her own life, which included a period of religious discernment. You could do that at the end of the 17th century, just interrupt your novel to talk about your own life. It was an admirable flexibility that we lost with the advent of the realist tradition. Um, anyway, Isabella's once wealthy father divides his estate between the Jesuits and a female religious house where his sister is abbess. If his daughter, the prettiest forward prattler in the world, with a thousand little charms to please, enters religious life herself, the income will go to her order, the rest of it. If she does not, <coughs> she will receive an enormous dowry that will enable her, enable her to marry a nobleman. She's a very clever girl. She learns music, rhetoric, foreign languages, becomes a marvel. Her aunt tries to put her thumb on the scale and encourage Isabella to become a nun, but the strictness of her devotion, her early prayers, and those continual, and innate steadfastness makes it unnecessary. When her father visits to see whether this religious vocation is really what is in her heart, we read, to all her father and the lady abbess could say of the world and its pleasures, Isabella brought a thousand reasons and arguments, so pious, so devout, that the abbess was very well pleased to find her <coughs> purposely weak, proposition so well overthrown. After she makes her final vows, Ben continues, there was never anyone who led so austere and pious a life as this young votress. She was a saint in the chapel and an angel at the grate. She there laid by all her severe looks and mortified discourse, and being at perfect peace and tranquility within, she was outwardly gay, sprightly, and entertaining, being satisfied no sights, no freedoms, could give any temptations to worldly desires. That's when Hanault shows up. Hanault, not Hanault, in the late 17th century, it was also acceptable to pronounce French words as if they were English. Uh, Carlyle believed this was acceptable in the 19th century as well, which is why we have records of him saying to a French cabbie, vous avez driver devilish slow. <laughs> uh, but uh, 
Hano is, is the brother of Sister Katerina, one of Isabella's fellow nuns, a lad of a melancholy temper and fit for soft impressions. He was very bookish and had the best tutors that could be got for learning and languages and all that could complete a man, but was unused to action and of a temper lazy and given to repose so that his father could hardly ever get him to use any exercise or so much as ride abroad, which he would call losing time from his studies. I, <clears throat> I believe the modern expression is sad boy. Um, but as, as you can imagine, what happens is that um, Hanolt uh, begins paying a series of visits to the monastery, and um, he and Isabella fall in love. And Isabella finds Katerina arguing with her brother, telling him that he needs to get over it uh, and resume his relations with Isabella only after he's conquered his passion for her. Isabella pretends not to have heard the conversation, but she says she has enough fortitude to see him. And of course, everyone trusts her, giving her a reputation for piety and sanctity. <clears throat> I won't go into too many details, but she runs away with him. And she steals a bunch of money from the convent into the process. They move to the country where they discover that it's not that easy to secure the sort of jolly pastoral existence they imagine that they are entitled to. Um, so Hinault decides to join the army uh, for money and also to please his father. Time passes while he's away fighting the wars. He doesn't return home. And one day, Isabella is visited by one of her husband's fellow officers, Villanois, that 17th century pronunciation of French again, a man who had been among her suitors uh, when she was young before she turned to religious life. Uh, the only one she really liked, as it happens, though she'd, of course, turned him down. Then, um, sort of like in Tennyson's Enoch Arden, a wonderful poem, which I've always thought must have been inspired, at least in part, by Ben, there's a period of sort of fumbling courtship during which Isabella insists that she must wait three years before they're married. When they do marry, she becomes wealthy, as her father had told her uh, she could be if she wanted to before she entered religious life. Seven years pass. You can imagine where this is going. Her other husband turns up. It turns out that he was captured and enslaved by the Turks. So, and this is where the story takes a kind of proto-Gothic turn, she offers um, him a bed and promptly suffocates him with a pillow rather than be exposed as a bigamist, however inadvertent in her crimes. When her husband returns, she explains that Hinault died of grief upon learning that she had remarried. Her husband agrees to throw the body into the river, but Isabella, wanting to be above reproach, <laughs> would you believe me if I said that on his way out the door, while he has this dead body in a sack straddled over his apparently very strong back, she stops him and says that some of the dead man's clothes are peeking through the bag and that she has to push them in and sew everything back up. <laughs> what she actually does is sew several strong stitches to the collar of Villanois's coat without his perceiving it and bid him go now. <clears throat> when he goes to the bridge, I don't know how far away it was, but we are told that love lent him strength with a capital S. He falls in along with the body. The bodies uh, both turn up, but Isabella has, well, a lot of times passed since the convent thing. The theft has been quietly hushed up, and we're all familiar with ex-religious, a reputation for piety. Emboldened by one wickedness, Ben writes, she was the readier for another, and another of such a nature as has, in my opinion, far less excuse than the first. But when fate begins to afflict, she goes through stitch with her black work. So later, while she's uh, being interrogated, we see her trying to practice a kind of mental reservation. Um, people are asking how this possibly happened. And she says, he got up and took this poor man and has occasioned his death. I mean, is that really a lie? Uh, but you also get uh, some moral reflection that uh, very much points forward. It sounds a lot like Jane Austen. Um, 
Different opinions and discourses were made concerning the opening of the eyes of the dead man and viewing Isabella, but she was a woman of so admirable life and conversation, of so undoubted a piety and sanctity of living, that not the least conjecture could be made of her having a hand in it besides the improbability of it. Yet the whole thing was a mystery, which, they thought, they ought to look into. I should admit before concluding my opening remarks that the book is not without issues. Ben refers to a character called Maria in passing, as if we were already acquainted with her on page 113, and then introduces to us actually a few pages later as someone who has apparently been with Isabella for a decade now, which is very convenient. It reminds me of in Robinson Crusoe when we meet his wife after he's off the island and then she dies in the same paragraph before we can learn her name. <laughs> Also, in some ways, stylistically, the book is a bit of a mess. Uh, tonally, it's all over the place. Ben hasn't quite arrived at the kind of verisimilitude um, that Defoe would achieve through the use of the first person. At times, Ben sounds like a chronicler or the narrator of an early prose romance. It happened not long after this. There came to the town a French gentleman who was taken at the siege of Candia. But in the novel's final paragraphs, which describe Isabella's execution after she has confessed her crimes, we find something so moving that um, I think it would almost be an act of desecration if I were to uh, paraphrase it. While she was in prison, she was always at prayers and very cheerful and easy, distributing all she had amongst and for the use of the poor of the town, especially to the poor widows, exhorting daily the young and fair that came perpetually to visit her, never to break a vow, for that was the first ruin of her, and she had never since prospered, do what other good deeds she could. When the day of execution came, she appeared on the scaffold all in mourning, but with a mien so majestic and charming, and a face so surprising fair, where no languishment or fear appeared, but all cheerful as a bride, that she set all hearts aflaming, even in that mortifying minute of preparation for death. She made a speech of half an hour long, so eloquent, so admirable a warning to the vow breakers, that it was as amazing to hear her as it was to behold her. After she had done with the help of Maria, she put off her mourning veil, and without anything over her face, she kneeled down, and the executioner, at one blow, severed her beautiful head from her delicate body, being then in her seventh and twentieth year. She was generally lamented and honorably buried. Ladies and gentlemen, reverend fathers, if there are any of you here, that is the Catholic imagination, if it means anything. How's this? Much better. Okay, great. Um, you never know in a panel discussion where your comments are going to begin. And mine begin with regret that Matthew Walther was not at the table with me in the dining hall at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor 20 something years ago when engaged in a discussion of Camus the Stranger. I said, why did Mersault kill that Arab? Because <laughs> <laughs> because the response of everybody present was who? And then I was some fellow from Baltimore said, Merceau, you doofus. So <laughs> I'm sure he didn't say doofus, but this is a Catholic event. So um, so, so that's where we begin with Mersault. Um, uh, there are all kinds of mispronunciations that I want to revisit tonight, including the possible mispronunciation of the very phrase Catholic imagination. Um, I, I teach... I direct, in fact, and founded a Master of Fine Arts program in creative writing at the University of St. Thomas that, um, uh, that very proudly, because I am proud of it, uh, claims to be the first and only Master of Fine Arts program founded in and firmly rooted in the Catholic intellectual and literary tradition. Um, what we do in the program is distinctive from every other program in the country, and it's because of its Catholicism that that difference is present. Uh, it makes it qualitatively superior. What, but nonetheless, when greeted with a phrase, 
Catholic imagination, I'm, I feel myself given pause. And the reason for that is um, because I'm somewhat curmudgeonly. And when I hear a term like Catholic imagination, I, I, I kind of hear the genealogy behind the word. And the genealogy behind the word is that the idea of thinking of imagination as something that, as a, as a, a thing that should be talked about, is something that goes back to, you know, more or less the German idealists and particularly to Immanuel Kant. Um, the origin of the phrase is to speak of imaginaries or imaginations is to propose that somehow uh, whatever the real world is, whatever the noumena is out there, we imagine the world in different ways. And, uh, you know, for, from a, the perspective of philosophy, that's a, that's a really preposterous and unfortunate claim because what we really are talking about is different accounts of the real. Um, nonetheless, I have a certain sympath sympathy for it. Father Greeley's book was quite a good read. Um, he, among other things that he says is that, uh, is that um, for instance, that uh, he was a sociologist in addition to being a priest. Maybe I should say he was a sociologist in addition to being a priest and a romance novelist. Um, but he, you know, one of the things he observes in that book is that um, Catholics are more likely to be than Protestants to be sympathetic with rioting, which if you ask Martin Luther, that's probably the case. Um, uh, and, you know, and, and I'm, I'm starting to blush now because I'm about to say this, but we, <laughs> the Catholic women are more likely to appreciate lingerie. So, um, you know, so there must be something to it, right? So, uh, <laughs> but the... the Greeley's, the origin of Greeley's thinking about the Catholic imagination was by a fairly arcane University of Chicago theologian, David Tracy, who published a book called The Analogical Imagination back in 1981. And it's a book I've read five pages of. And it, um, and, and what it's trying to argue, I think, uh, that's why I only read five pages, was, um, was that, uh, Protestants and Catholics have difficulty meeting each other on the terrain of doctrine. So let's back up from the specific doctrinal claims that we are making and try to look at the sort of epiphenomena of those claims, the, the way in which we envision the world. And I confess that that's a fairly helpful way to think about things. But again, I, I, I just, something just doesn't sit right with me in general about talking about the imagination in general. Um, uh, most of us who, you know, praise God, have not read Immanuel Kant, have our, our knowledge of this idea of the imagination at second hand by way of a paragraph from uh, Coleridge, uh, whom everybody should read. And Coleridge speaks of the primary and the secondary imagination. And what he's doing, and he's just transcribing Kant really here, but, um, but it's the way he gets it is just a little bit original, is that the primary imagination, when you talk about the primary imagination, it's the way in which you envision the world. Um, evangelical Christians will talk about having a world view, and that's, they didn't know they were Coleridgean romantic Kantians, but they are. Um, and then Coleridge says, there's also the secondary imagination, which is what most of us are talking about when we use the word imagination. The primary imagination is how you see the world. The secondary imagination on Coleridge's terms is the, that particular faculty that takes the stuff of the world that you see and makes a particular work of art. So Coleridge's primary imagination sees the world in a certain way. His secondary imagination writes a poem called This Lime Tree Bower My Prison. And there's a certain overlap. The primary imagination finds expression in the secondary imagination. So what that means is when we talk about the Catholic imagination, we can ask, be asking two questions. One, how do Catholics see the world? And two, how do Catholics make works of art? And those are both distinguished question, distinguishable questions, but also big questions. Um, they're also, in a way, kind of dumb questions because, because I just think, you know, it's better to talk about accounts of the good, accounts of the real, wh what is being. But what gives me pause as I'm about to call a bunch of things dumb is that 
the some of the people I admire most in the world really do give us something like an account of the Catholic imagination or speak in those terms in a way that I think is very fruitful. And I'll just name three real quickly. Joseph Pieper, um, who's you know one of the most lovely Catholic philosophers of the 20th century, perhaps the greatest, he says that in the modern age, we suffer from a decline in the ability to see, that human beings are losing their ability to see. And he does not mean that people are nearsighted the way I am. He means that they have a lack of the faculty of perceiving being. Jacques Maritain, no less great, I think, on the whole than Pieper, certainly no worse a prose writer. Um, uh, Maritain says in the introduction to the degrees of knowledge, which is one of the most important books of 20th century Neo-Thomist philosophy, he says that after four centuries of the Cartesian rationalist reduction, human beings probably have suffered from a loss of what he'll call elsewhere, the intuition of being, um, which is not some sort of special faculty that allows certain people to see being, but rather is just kind of an alacrity for the perception of the real. So what Pieper's talking about, what Maritain's talking about, is that our cultural training, our habituation to being in the world can actually make us less perceptive of what is nonetheless real. Thanks be to God, reality doesn't depend upon us. Hans Urs von Balthasar, who I think stands shoulder to shoulder with these other two, in his first book of his theological aesthetics, The Glory of the Lord, speaks of the need to see the form. And the whole 600 pages of that first volume are about the problems we confront in seeing the form. What does that mean? Well, you know, um, here's a quick example. If you engage in a conversation with, um, what's that guy in North Carolina, Bert Bart Ehrman, some, some former evangelical, he'll, um, you say, well, the gospel of Mark says this, or this is what the gospels teach us. He will, he will take the gospel and like, um, you know, a frail bit of papyrus, he will crinkle it in his hands until it turns to dust. He'll say this, this sentence comes from here. This one's probably a typographical error and so on and so forth. So there's no gospel of Mark. There's a series of fragments that people call the gospel of Mark. What von Balthasar said is, this, is, this is a fundamental mistake. There's no getting behind form. And so from von Balthasar's view, the challenge for the modern Catholic was to recover the capacity not to disintegrate things in their, into their material elements, but to re-envision things as they actually are, which is in terms of seeing them in terms of their formal totalities. I'll give you an example of why that airman sort of approach to things has never tempted me. And that's because when I was 19, I read T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. The Wasteland is 432 lines. 100 of those lines are either entirely or in part quotations. Do we say that the real meaning of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland is to be deduced to or reduced to a line from Augustine's Confessions or from the Buddha or from Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy? No, to the contrary, as we see the, the roots of his language burrowing down into the tradition, we realize that that deepens the meaning, but we nonetheless recognize that the artwork has an integrity to itself. It has a form. So with these three admonishments, Pieper, Maritain, and von Balthasar in mind, I'm, I want to indulge this idea of a Catholic imagination for just a couple minutes. And I'm going to stick with T.S. Eliot. Matthew mentioned just a few moments ago the Catholic novel from the middle of the 20th century, and indeed the novel as our primary art form, primary literary art form anyhow, in the contemporary age, and for the last 200 plus years, has had an effect. When the novel becomes your paradigm, if you're at all religious, that poses a problem, because the novel originated as effectively a kind of fictionalized sociology. It was intended from its advent to just show the way things are in certain societies. Um, all you have to have done is read one novel by Jane Austen to, to know that. Um, and that's, as Christopher Beha, the 
Catholic novelist points out, that actually is makes the novel a very unusual stepchild in the patrimony of the arts because all the other art forms, music, poetry, drama, they all have a sacral origin, every last one of them. Only the novel was born secular. So what do we do if that secular vision of the real seems impoverished, seems too concerned with who's marrying who, and not enough about where your soul goes when you die? T.S. Eliot was confronted with that problem in the early 1920s. When he first read Joyce's Ulysses, he was deeply moved by the realization that the novel was never actually an art form in the first place. It was rather the expression at a certain historical moment of a certain socioeconomic class. Only Joyce had made the novel into a form and by shattering it. What Joyce did, he proposed, is to make not possible not sociology, but myth with all capital letters. What he was praising there for was the ability of Joyce's Ulysses to speak of realities beyond a particular social class, beyond indeed the social per se, and to enter into an encounter with reality by way of a work of art. What Joyce did, in other words, was turn the novel into a poem, because it is as ancient as the art of poetry to think of poetry as the first form that gathers the uneven heartbeat of reality into a steady measure and allows us to see the form of how things are. In Religion and Literature, published in 1935, T.S. Eliot comes back and praises Joyce yet again. He praises him in contrast to people he otherwise admires, George Eliot and G.K. Chesterton. Sorry, forget George Eliot for tonight. Uh, George, it's a long essay. Um, We'll, we'll, we'll stick with George Herbert and, and uh, G.K. Chesterton. How does Joyce contrast with these two? Herbert, as many people know, is the great devotional poet of the 17th century. And from the time of Coleridge forward, people could not read him without thinking he was a bit naive until they got older. And then they realized that he was much wiser than they'd ever been. The reason for that is that for, for Herbert, Poetry is, his poetry is not concerned with the existential anguish of whether God exists. He knows God exists. He's concerned with why God hasn't made him happy, even though he's trying to be an obedient servant. And it takes a certain degree of spiritual ma uh, maturity to be able to appreciate what Herbert is, um, is attempting to achieve. Eliot in Religion and Literature dismisses Herbert as a minor poet. The last thing T.S. Eliot wrote before he died was a small book on George Herbert where he praised him as the greatest of English poets. T.S. Eliot grew up. But nonetheless, from, in 1935, T.S. Eliot's point stands. Herbert looks to most people like a kind of naive devotional poet whose concerns are sort of bracketed and set outside from the concerns of the average person. What, um, what Coleridge would have called the business-like concerns of people. Um, Chesterton, in contrast, is a fellow who's writing Catholic novels, although he wasn't Catholic at the time, but from the perspective of somebody who says, I know I live in a um, society that's more influenced by the H.G. Wells and the George Bernard Shaws and the Oscar Wildes of the world. I know I live in a non-Christian society. And so I'm going to write a Father Brown mystery to stand athwart that and say, stop. It's propaganda, says Eliot. Not that it's propaganda in Chesterton's hands because every, Chesterton's wonderful, but it's prop, it becomes propaganda when anybody else does it. And that's a problem. So Eliot says, Joyce. Why Joyce? He is what Eliot calls in that essay, unconsciously Christian, by which he means the following. Joyce presents to us the world as it actually is. Not as a propagandist who tells us what, how it ought to be, not as, Her not as Herbert presents it, which is how it appears to people who have attained a certain degree of spiritual maturity, but to how it typically is in the age. And that yet in that vision, Joyce comprehends the sacred. 
So yet again, Joyce has done something that the novel had not done before. He managed, manages to shatter the horizon of the sociological novel and to make it a complete account of the real. Now, the fact that Joyce didn't believe in God had nothing, to, made no difference. What Eliot's arguing here is that what Joyce does is he introduces to us an idea of the imagination or the, lit, the literary vision that conforms in some ways to what we find in Plato's Republic. Most people are consumed with appearances, but there are those who escape and can see the full horizon of the world that ascends not from just appearances or from becoming, but up to being and the sunlight of the good. And even if Joyce couldn't see the good properly, what he did was make possible an art that did. I meant to say at the start that my, the title of these comments is a, a Dei Filius for Artists. And the reason I wanted to say that at the start, which I forgot to do, was because then you'd know when I said Dei Filius, I was coming to the end of my comments. <laughs> now I'm finally coming there. In Dei Filius, the only document to emerge from the first Vatican Council, as opposed to the Logoria of the second, is a statement that says that any Catholic who denies that natural reason can establish the existence of God and the existence of a knowable, rational, moral order, let him be anathema. A statement of faith, of creedal faith, that is to say, you will be accursed if you don't subscribe to it. You will be condemned if you don't subscribe to it. A statement of faith insists that reason can do its work. The Catholic imagination or the Catholic account of the real has special application to all aspects of life, including the literary arts, precisely because the Catholic account of the real says, that's right, unless we will risk being condemned to hell, we must maintain the openness of our eyes to all that is real. We must remain open to being. And in our day, that's especially worth learning because almost all the literary world has a blinkered vision. It has closed its eyes upon some small-minded ideology, whether the usual stuff of diversity and equity or on something even smaller, mere material being. And so it's a great blessing to have the Catholic imagination insofar as it's the one imagination that requires that we take in not just society, not just a particular social class, but the whole of being and trying to manifest it so that other people may, may, may regain their sight. Thanks. You got it. Hello. Hello. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Thank you. That was delightful. Um, I look forward to the generation of Joyce imitators coming from your graduate program. Um, that actually dovetails really nicely with my comments here. I'm not going to be as theoretical as that was. That was really helpful actually for me. Um, I'm, I'm not a PhD. I'm not really a scholar. I'm a practicing artist. So for me, this question is one of practical urgency. Um, and it, it boils down to a matter of the relationship between the Catholic artist and his or her audience or lack thereof, as we often find. They're, they're, the audience that, that the Catholic artist is working for um, can seem to be ever diminishing. And, and it's, it's a little bit of a frustrating situation. So um, I want to speak to that question as, as, um, in my comments here, which I think will be shorter. And I apologize. <laughs> but yes. Um, OK, so when we talk about the Catholic imagination, which I think we have a fairly decent working definition, but I will add a little bit to that definition as we go. We entered the murky question of the relationship between the artist and the audience. For every work of art, there is an audience in mind. It's, it's a little bit of a trope. If you're teaching someone to write, you say, think of your audience. But um, as you continue to work as an artist, it becomes more and more important to conceive of your audience as you work because each piece is essentially an attempt at communication and the root word of communication is communion. So your audience must be something outside of yourself because 
to merely commune with yourself is certainly not a Catholic notion. So the question of who is the audience is one that Catholic artists should be quite concerned with. Who is this other with whom we hope to communicate through this piece of art? Um, so more specifically, as we look at the question of the imagination, I found myself asking, whose imagination are we talking about? Are we talking about a generalized, somewhat abstracted Catholic communication, or are we talking about the imagination of the artist or the imagination of the audience? Because it seems like we have, a, when, you, when you encounter a piece of art, you have a meeting place of imaginations. So I think it's not really one or the other that we're speaking here, but the Catholic imagination is that meeting place of many imaginations around a symbol around what, uh, and I use that word the way that the great, the greatest <laughs> poet David Jones uses it. Um, he's a 20th century Welsh poet. And for him, all is symbol because everything is an indication of the real, like we're talking about. And, and within the greatest things, specifically the Eucharist, the thing signified and the thing doing the signifying have become perfectly, perfectly matched with each other. And that's what we all aspire to. We are all symbols of God in our own way. And so we aspire as we become more like God to perfectly blend what we signify with the way that we signify it. Um, so when I say symbol, that's what I mean. Uh, and, and I'm just borrowing that from David Jones. So um, we're looking at we have the imagination or the, the imaginative vision of the artist in which the artist is, I, it depends on how, it, different artists would say it differently, is receiving, encountering, having some kind of vision of that which is signified by the symbol that he encounters. So he's having an imaginative vision, which he's then attempting to communicate to the imagination of the audience. Um, and don't worry, I'm gonna give examples. If this all sounds a little bit pie in the sky, I have examples. So this is sort of the theoretical part and it will come down to earth soon. Um, so that would produce that perfectly rendered experience where the, the artist has done his job and has given the, the, the symbolic signifier that almost perfectly, because we can't do this perfectly, but almost perfectly captures that which he is attempting to signify. That's, and then that's received by an imagination that's fertile, that's prepared, that can read the signs. That's when you have that experience that we call imagination. When we say the, ima the Catholic imagination, it's that moment when a group of people have been prepared to receive this symbol and to get a sense of what is signified. So I think the main contention that I'm gonna make in these remarks is that to talk about the Catholic imagination in terms of an individual is pointless. This is a communal activity and it depends on imaginations in conversation with each other, which puts the contemporary Catholic artist in an interesting situation because we don't have a, a ready-made audience like many of the Catholic artists of the past. We don't have a ready-made audience who know the symbols, who even if they aren't 100% prepared, they, they don't know even what we're talking about in many ways. So it, it, it can feel like an impoverished landscape for the Catholic artists, which I think is some part of why we're having this conversation because Catholic artists don't know how to create this kind of imaginative art in a landscape where their audience doesn't know how to read the signs that they're trying to use. So I have a bit of a proposal for how we can, as practicing artists, how we can address that. And as readers or appreciators of art, how we can best approach these pieces of art um, and, and seek to know how to read those signs, even if we don't have the kind of training in, in our rich heritage that we want, which I don't have. I mean, I'm still learning every day. A lot of what 
<laughs> was said, I, I was thinking, oh dear, I need to read these things. So none of us are really as equipped as we should be to read the signs. Um, so let's see, sorry, my notes are a little scattered because I always do everything by hand. Um, okay, so art that's taking place within this sphere that I'm calling the Catholic imagination, this communal sphere, um, it, I contend that it needs to exist in a way that either challenges or invites audiences to consider more fully some uniquely Christian way of living and thinking. So there is a, I don't like the word doctrinal, but there is a doctrinal element to this because we are people of the book. We believe certain things. And part of the task of the artist who is wanting to inhabit the sphere of Catholic art is to be working with the signs that are associated with those doctrines. Now, there are a lot of caveats with how we do that. This does not at all mean that we are dogmatic. It's very important that we not become dogmatic within our art. So some of those themes that could be playing around in the, the imaginative space would be the creation of the world. It's one of my favorites. Um, the arc of redemptive history, the possibility or impossibility of miracles, um, the reality of the sacraments. That's a great one. If you've ever read any Charles Williams, he really might be the master of exploring what, what does it really mean if the soul is changed at baptism? What does that actually mean? It's, it, it's a wonderful, that one that is in um, All Hallows' Eve, in his novel All Hallows' Eve, it's delightful. Um, and then of course, the universal and eternal nature of the church is a question that, that we can play with, and most importantly, the word made flesh, because that is the symbol of symbols. I can't even talk about it <laughs> without tearing up. Um, so, I should have warned you all, when I talk about literature, I invariably cry. It, it will it will happen. Um, so the difficulty for the practicing artists today is that we just have fewer and fewer of those, those places, those themes available to us as we create. People don't believe in creation. And if they think about it, many of them don't care. Um, people don't believe in miracles. It, they find them, it would be better if they found them disturbing. They find them dull. Wh wh what's an artist supposed to do with that? <laughs> um, you would rather live in a, in a virulently, violently atheistic, anarchist society where at least they would take us out and shoot us than they just don't look at our art because it doesn't matter to them. That's a very difficult place to be in. So the religious artist finds himself walking a fine line between merely appealing to shared dogma to attract an audience that shares their, their dogmatic beliefs or of avoiding mentioning religious themes at all for fear of alienating their audience. And neither of those approaches, the dogmatic appeal or the avoidance appeal, are truly imaginative. Um, they're, they're both based in... They're, they're, to use the really helpful designation here, they're avoiding the real. So the artist has to find a way to talk about the real. So now I'm going to give you three examples of contemporary art that do what must be done um, in, in this space of the modern world. The way that we have to do this is through surprise. Um, and that can take a couple of forms. So to many people today, the basic elements of Catholic thought have already been considered and discarded, considered as a stretch. They've been encountered and ignored. Um, so you, that, that you have many people who they, they know of Jesus. They roughly know, oh, we think the Eucharist becomes Jesus and there are nuns. And that's pretty much what they know. And it hasn't captured their imagination, so they've just moved on. We're not trying to take pagan elements in a world and Christianize them like the early Christians were, where they took the symbol of the cross and they, there you go again, <laughs> they made it something, they, they, it's a great example because it, it has the two meanings of the torture and death and the new life, and the symbol itself has become both. 
it was not originally both. It has become both through the exertion of Catholic artists. That is Catholic imaginative work. To take a symbol and to, through deep imaginative effort, give it the opposite meaning while allowing it to retain its its real meaning, its meaning as a symbol of death, to give it another real meaning. So in many ways, that's not our task anymore because our audience is not pagans. Our audience is people who have already seen and rejected. So we almost have to trick them. We don't get to just take their symbols and make them better. We have to do something that is actually, I think, a little bit more challenging from an artistic perspective. What we have to do is we have to, we have to startle them. We have to represent to them the symbols that they've already found boring and reignite in them a recognition of what is going on and why those symbols are valuable for them. So um, the first example that I want to offer you is Ron Hansen's novel, Mariette in Ecstasy, which is a slim little novel. It's it's quite disturbing. Um, if you if you haven't read it, I very much recommend it. I think it's Ron Hansen's best work. And it within it, it's, it's an epistolatory novel. So it takes place completely as letters between members of a religious community. Um, I think there's one letter from someone outside the religious community. I can't quite remember. If anyone remembers, let me know. But it's it's about a an event that's unfolding within the religious community where it appears that one of the women is receiving the stigmata. Because of the form of the novel as letters, you've already introduced a layer of uncertainty about what's real because every letter is written from a different perspective each narrator is if not unreliable and some of them are they're at least very limited in their perspective and you're receiving multiple versions of every event so what happens from the instant the novel starts is the reader is disoriented you don't know who to trust. You don't know what's actually going on. I mean, at, at some point in the novel, you find yourself questioning the sanity of every person in the religious, in the religious community. And it's a, it's a very startling way to a, approach this question of sanctity and the stigmata, miracles, religious communities. I don't want to give away the ending because it's, 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 I think it's really a flawless ending. It's, it's a hard book to pull off, and he does it. But I will say, the reason it succeeds, and this book was read and appreciated by many secular readers, the reason it succeeds is because what he does is he creates a world where you are so thrown off by what is real on a practical level. What did they eat? Sometimes they disagree about what they ate for lunch that day. Nobody knows what's going on, and you're so thrown off that the question of whether miracles can happen is suddenly on the table. You never really get to the point where you question whether the stigmata is possible, because all you're questioning is whether this girl is having a true religious experience, or if she's psychologically disturbed, or if she's maniving, like conniving and manipulative. But all of those options are possible. So you could give this novel to someone who doesn't believe in the transcendent, and there would come a point where in reading it, the possibility of a miracle is just as likely as some other explanation. It's really a dazzling display of how the Catholic imagination can disrupt agnosticism. Um, and and it, it, so formally, he sets up a situation where everyone is, is thrown into doubt. And from that doubt, the possibility of the transcendent emerges. So that's my first example. Um, the second example is Lauris by Eugene Badalaskin, which I think is just a really significant novel. I think if if people do read our novels in 100 years, <laughs> they'll read that one for sure. Um, and, and in it, he does much the same thing where he creates a world that's so odd and startling that he can introduce things as plausible that our culture wouldn't readily accept otherwise. So he, he almost zaps your imagination 
down to nothing and then rebuilds it. And he, I want to keep it short because I know we have another speaker, but he does that through language. Um, If you've read it, the translator also is brilliant. But if you've read the novel, you've noticed that it has a lot of archaic language and then it will skip to contemporary slang. And it's all mashed together in a way that creates a a linguistic world that's startling. You never know what's going to happen in the next sentence. And his characters shift form, they change names, you, you never know who's who, they reappear in different places, there's even some time travel involved. And the way it, it works because all of the novel is in service of giving contemporary urgency to a question that most people today wouldn't, even many Catholics, would just write off. And that central question is, can we, through our actions, save the soul of another? which that's a question that many people throughout Catholic history would have answered unequivocally, of course, but we've lost that sense of our salvation is bound up together. We can be laboring for salvation for another through, we can, through our sacrifices, through our, through our acts of charity, we can actually affect the eternal fate of our neighbor. And that's normally something that a contemporary reader, simply there, there's no urgency to that. Well, of course you can't do it. But the way that he sets this novel up, your imagination is expanded. It's almost an evangelical situation where he's he's evangelizing to you. He's reminding you what of the beautiful, complex mystery of salvation. Um, I want to talk to you about the Anathemata as well by David Jones, but I don't know if I have time. So if anyone wants to hear about it, ask me afterwards. Um, it's 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 just wonderful. So just to wrap up, um, I think the question of whether the Catholic imagination is dumb, which is the phrasing that we've been using (laughs) casually, (laughs) is the Catholic imagination dumb? Um, Whether it's dumb or not, I think it exists. It's, It's the space that Catholic artists work in or want to work in. It's, it's shrinking. It's difficult to find nowadays, but it's something that we can all aspire to participate in. Um, And the trick, I think, if we want to be creating for contemporary audiences is to use these kinds of startling narrative choices to to shock the imagination. And I don't say that we need to be using obscenities or anything like that, but to use formal things to shock our audiences and to, to reinvigorate their imaginations to receive Catholic realities. Um, I'm sorry, I have a bit of a cold, so I have a runny nose here. Um, Obviously, one caveat that I want to mention, because I think it'll make for good discussion, I say that the art must work to deepen or um, enhance our understanding of a Christian sign or symbol. Doesn't necessarily have to be a Christian artist doing it, though. Um, There are Buddhist, Hindu Muslim Jewish artists whose work does that for us. So I will wrap up there and I hope I didn't go too long. Thank you very much. <laughs> am I am I on? Yes, I am. Right, well thank you everybody. And my apologies again for being a little bit late. Um, I'd like to thank my Uber driver, Ibrahim, who is not getting a tip. Um, <laughs> I also have uh, three tiny apologies to make before I begin. Um, The first is um, to any alumni of Notre Dame who might be in the audience here. Um, A second apology uh, to Angelico Press because this, my remarks turn out to be a massive subtweet of a book they've just published in English, uh, which we will get to. Uh, Third apology to all of you here. I forgot to to polish my shoes this morning, so I apologize for my appearance. Um, Let's get, uh, let's get started. Um, I have written out my comments in full to prevent us all from being here for three hours. So, what would Catholic classicism look like? To answer that question, we would have to define Catholic Romanticism. The two terms have been defined in opposition to one another ever since the novelist Stendhal's pro-romantic pamphlets, which were collected in 1823 and 1825 under the title Racine et Shakespeare. Um, Shakespeare is French for Shakespeare. (laughs) Um, 
Stendhal made fun of the classicism of his time, which ignored the realities of contemporary life. Um, I should add here, by the way, that Stendhal is the first major writer to describe himself positively as a romantic. In the English-speaking world, our views of classicism versus romanticism come from T.S. Eliot, whose views are parallel to those of the English poet T.E. Hume, who died in the Great War. Um, to quote the most important line in Hume's 1912 essay, Romanticism and Classicism, the view which, which regards man as a well, a reservoir full of possibilities, I call the romantic the one which regards him as a very finite and fixed creature I call the classical. There's more to it than that, of course, but we can start from there. Now, whether you call yourself a classicist in Hume's or Stendhal's sense, you are looking less to Greece or Rome than to French culture at the court of Louis XIV during the latter half of the 17th century, or else to English culture between the restoration of the monarchy in 1660 and the American Revolution. Whereas a romantic is looking to the turbulent age that began with the American Revolution, culminated in the French Revolution, and died with Napoleon in 1821, or Shelley in 1822, or Byron in 1824. The central figure in Catholic Romanticism is François René de Chateaubriand, who was born in 1768 and died in 1848, and was passionately devoted to the American Revolution until the serious killings started in the French Revolution. Chateaubriand's great inspiration was Rousseau. I should add here, very interesting, um, I think Chateaubriand was the first French writer to use the term romantic in more or less the sense that we use it. This was in 1797 in his essay on the revolution. Um, then he converted uh, to Catholicism in 1798. The first fruits of his frantic self-education and newfound faith were the novella Atala in 1801, the short story René in 1802, and the massive 1802 apologetic compendium La Génie du Christianisme, The Genius of Christianity. In 800 pages, this unlikely bestseller expounded on the poetic and moral beauties of faith. And um, this is now published by Angelico in an 1856 English translation. You should all run out and buy it as soon as possible. Um, we should ignore the fact that Chateaubriand did not live a life that obviously matched the piety or devotion of his words. Let us concentrate on the Génie du Christianisme itself. This is the sort of work that Stendhal would have dismissed as classicist and T. E. Hume would have condemned as romantic. Chateaubriand's work feels like a university dissertation. It must have been far more enlightening to write than it is to read. Its greatest weakness is its failure to embody or exemplify its own principles. Chateaubriand's style, structure, and approach are superficially classicist. But Chateaubriand as a writer could not be contained by classical style, order, balance, or structure. His real focus throughout his literary career remained himself, his emotions, and his memories. The tensions between Chateaubriand's self-centeredness, his perceptions of himself, and his fixation on his public image are what give Atala and René their power. Chateaubriand's, claims to greatness, or Chateaubriand's claim to greatness originates from his radical egotism, his conviction that his thoughts and impressions were so important that educated people ought to pay attention. No wonder Chateaubriand was Victor Hugo's first literary hero. But is this an attitude that a Catholic writer should ever embody? Chateaubriand was an emotive sensualist, wallowing in the pleasures of his own mind, body, and experience, and expressing himself about these at length, confident in the assumption that everything he said was in some way attractive to whoever wanted to listen. 
He took for granted that he had a devoted audience, and indeed he had one for La Génie du Christianisme, consisting of desperate, exhausted readers, nostalgic for the world before 1789. They wanted comfort, not truth. You can use La Génie du Christianisme as a cheat sheet for the doctrines, traditions, and high culture of the Catholic Church up to 1789. But there is a deeper flaw in the work that renders it useless, except as a sort of bluffer's guide to Catholicism. This involves Chateaubriand's attitudes towards external realities and objective truth. Attila and René were conceived long before Chateaubriand's conversion. Yet he included them in early versions of La Génie du Christianisme, purportedly to help him illustrate certain points in his nebulous argument, but really to promote himself as an artist. The only literary work of any standing that built on the principles asserted throughout the Génie du Christianisme was Chateaubriand's own prose pseudo-epic The Martyrs, published in 1809. The Martyrs is valuable mainly as an illustration that sentimentality is just externalized self-pity. The work is forgotten. Externalized self-pity always has an instant audience, but never a lasting one, because the sentimental are loyal mainly to their own emotions. Chateaubriand's Génie du Christianisme can neither convince nor convert anyone because it has no fundamental basis in objective truth, only subjective opinions and personal feelings. When he hits on deeper truths, it seems a coincidence or accident. Even if his faith was authentic, his words do nothing to inspire faith in others. He prefers to encourage fantasy or wallowing. His real aim is to make you admire him or identify with him. Now, culture is the sound of society talking to itself. The purpose of Catholic classicism must be to rebuild a culture that has all but committed suicide in the wake of self-styled reformers of the past 70 years. Like Father Hesburgh of Notre Dame, whose intellect was of Chateaubriand quality at best. American Catholics live in the ruins created by initiatives like Father McCluskey's Lando Lake Statement of July 1967, whose drafting committee included Uncle Ted McCarrick. Uh, we don't have time for a fraudulent Catholic classicism of the sort condemned by Stendhal, which would amount to a Catholic version of a Civil War reenactment society. On the other hand, the classicism of T.E. Hulme turned out to be barren too, because there was no living God at its heart. Hulme saw reality, but could not quite recognize it for what it was. Now, Catholic classicism should begin from a reality that was denigrated by both Uncle Ted's, McCarrick and Hesburg. The Catholic tradition is a classical one. See Luke 23, 38 and John 19, 19 to 1920. Classical Greek, Latin and Hebrew are sacred by virtue of their presence at the crucifixion on the sign that was written by Pontius Pilate and affixed to the cross itself, proclaiming who our king is. This is where our classical tradition begins. And this is where it must lead us back. We have to convince others to come along with us too. Our salvation depends upon it. Thank you. Well, thank you guys so much um, for uh, this wide ranging discussion. Looking at the time here, because we got started it a bit late, um, is everyone okay with just turning it over to uh, folks here for questions, and we'll go from there. Just raise your hands up. If you have or manifestos, despite which we we can have one kind of unhinged <laughs> manifesto tonight.
Uh, well, first of all, thank you all. I uh, uh, really enjoyed all of your all of your talks. Um, so, just as I was listening to all of you, I was thinking: Is there a conflation of two different things that are called the Catholic imagination? Um, it just seems to me on the on the one hand, you have this sense of let's say the imagination as it's classically understood in relation to reason, and how that should be known. That should be like a truth of it, it should be a, a, a truth of, of reason. It should be something known naturally. But it is a time, let's say, where there's much confusion, something that becomes very unclear. And this kind of gets, uh, Professor Wilson, I think, at your point of the Catholic faith affirming as a dogma of faith natural reason, right? So the sense in which this, this sense in which the imagination, as I think it was classically understood, is this mediator between sensation and intelligibility, you know, between what we sense, what we, between reality or intelligibility, and then this new modern Kantian kind of pure, this idea of like a pure creation, un unshackled by reality or intelligibility, which I, which I think also gets at the romantic idea. Um, so on the one hand, uh, the Catholic imagination is just restoring or, or retrieving what classically was imagination in an era where that's no longer obvious, like it once, as I think it once was. And on the other hand, you have, um, I'm sorry, I forgot uh, your name, but yes. Uh, what, Jane, what you were talking about, which is what I took to be more um, the imagination or, or art as it takes as its explicit subject matter let's say the supernatural end of man and those things that go along with it, redemption, sacraments and such. So um, sorry if that was a speech question, I apologize, but I, I want <laughs> Very long question. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry about that. But to any and all of you, I just wonder like, if, you have, if, that's, if there's something to that, that maybe this question is, uh, we're, it's a little confused from the start right, outright because we've conflated two things to be the Catholic imagination. Is it working now? Okay, I can try to respond to that and I hope it is helpful. Um, I, I, I see, so I think you're correct. The, the word imagination is just so difficult. When, when I saw the question for this panel, I thought, oh my goodness, what are we gonna do? Because we don't really have a true sense of what the imagination actually is. And whenever we use it, we're invoking both of those. We're evoking the Kantian and also that quasi-rational, or not, it's not even quasi-rational, that element, that that rational element that we use. So I think when we talk about the Catholic imagination, the, the terms are quite muddled. Um, yeah, I don't know. Can you, can you just narrow your question a tiny bit? Is that helpful? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you everyone for a fantastic panel. I think I'd like to take Jane's presentation, turn it into a question, and pose it to the rest of you, <laughs> which is, where are the readers in all this? And you ask for short questions, so I'm leaving it there. So I'll start. Um, the, you asked a short question, I'll give you a, a very short answer. They don't exist, no one reads. <laughs> the, the audience, yeah. They're the, all dead. The, um, but no, to uh, give you a slightly longer answer. I mean, I, I think that this, this is one of the tensions here, right, where some of the strategies that Jane is describing, you know, in a novelist like, in the work of a novelist like Ron Hansen or whatever, where you see either in terms of subject matter or in terms of, you know, uh, things that are happening in the plot or both, um, something that's explicitly Catholic, you know, content wise or in terms of framing or whatever. I guess I ask myself if, if you're going to do that, you're probably going to restrict your audience. Um, 
if you want to do the Jane Austen thing and work purely at the level of the natural, you know, and write in the realist tradition about morals, manners, you know, marriage and money, I think that there's a sense in which there are novelists who have audiences, you know, by today's standards that are large, um, or, um, television writers or something, uh, who are trying to do that. Um, but it's not the Catholic imagination. It's just um, good art or good writing. Um, and it kind of fails or succeeds on its own terms, um, which I think just brings me back to my kind of skepticism of the Catholic imagination as a coherent framework for assessing, for assessing you know, aesthetic objects. That, that question reminds me of um, a passage that my, uh, my students and I just read a couple weeks ago from Etienne Gelson's book, The Arts of the Beautiful, where he re-describes the history of modern art from Nietzsche to the 1950s when he published the book. And, uh, and Gilson's whole argument is that um, all philosophies of art from Aristotle forward are too intellectualist. They're trying to think of the making of art as a kind of knowing, whereas in fact it's just a kind of giving birth. It's bringing something new into being. And um, he's an especially provocative uh, example that the, that the, that the woodcarver begins with the feeling of a jackknife in his hand. And there's nothing intellectual, it's just, it's just the, the feeling there. And I kind of understand that. I, I, I am the world's worst guitar player, but I can't, I, I, the, my guitar sits by my, the door to my office and I can't walk by it without picking it up and banging out a two, few terrible chords. Um, it's, it's compulsive, it's, it's almost mechanical. It's more about just making a, a sound than anything else. So I understand that, but Jill Stone, goes on, he says, so Nietzsche was art's revenge, making's revenge against knowledge. And he's referring to the birth of tragedy specifically. Uh, that Nietzsche would reduce art to pure form, a pure making of form, as opposed to any kind of noetic content. And he continues, and the poets have followed suit. They have denounced poetry as having anything to say whatsoever. It's just a pure sound. It's a wonderful rhapsodic paragraph that ends, almost ends with a semicolon. After the semicolon is, only the readers are missing. <laughs> um, I, I think one of the, the I, blessings of having a poet like Dana Joya as such a prominent voice for Catholic letters is that he has a certain populist sensibility and recognizes that, um, that the concern with audience is not a matter of indifference. Um, and uh, for my part, I spend most of my time talking to classical schools and classical, classical, classical school students, excuse me, and classical school teachers, because I appreciate that um, in the same way that virtually nobody appreciates Beethoven unless they've been given lessons in how to play the violin, the cello, Virtually nobody can appreciate what occurs in a line of verse unless they've been forced to write a line of iambic pentameter. Um, the fine arts are arts of, they're practical arts and practicing arts is the way in which we come to understand them. However, this really doesn't go very far in answering your question because what you're really describing is the great tidal wave of mass culture that has completely swamped us and um, very few violins are gonna overcome that noise. Oh, please, off to you. Oh, okay, this will be quick. Um, I think one of the things that I, I think is really important when we ask ourselves, who is our audience? Um, I think, especially in the world of social media where the entire world is at our front door, it can be really easy for artists to get swept up into thinking that their audience needs to be as big as the world. And I think it's really important that we recognize that sometimes our audience is our best friends, our godparents, the people in our parish, and that is not a smallness of vision. If you write something that truly brings the sign 
closer to what it signifies and eight people read it, you are, that is a triumphant piece of art. And I think sometimes we forget that Dante wasn't writing art for people in France in the 1900s. He was writing art for a very specific and small group of people. And his art just happened, not, not just happened, but it did just happen to become this massive universal experience. So I think when we ask who is our audience, for me at least, I when I write something, I'm usually writing it for two or three people. That's it. If they like it, if they are stirred by it, that's a success. And I choose the people carefully so that hopefully they're the biggest souls I know. And sometimes they are dead, honestly. <laughs> and sometimes they haven't been born yet. But they're not, it's not the number of people. It's the, it's the, 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 the depth of their encounter with the piece. So I would encourage any artist to recognize that a small audience is not, it's not a small vision if your audience is small. Um, in fact, I don't think I can add very much to that except to say that um, I can't conceive of literature without the audience first, really. Literature is fundamentally a form of communication. Um, otherwise, it's um, crying into a diary or whatever it is people do these days. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm brought to mind of a conversation I had with a friend um, who was thinking of taking a, a year off and just to fulfill his dream of becoming a writer. And um, he decided to send me uh, a couple of his ideas for books he really wanted to write, uh, all absolutely dreadful. And I had to tell him so because he's a friend and I didn't want him to waste too much time um, unsuccessfully. But um, he's, when I, I told him what was, I told him that his ideas could not possibly reach the audience that he wanted to reach. And um, he told me, oh, you're being too negative. The criterion for writing these things ought to be quality. And I said, and my response was, what criterion of quality are you using? Um, if you're using a criterion of quality that allows you to evade all criticism because you are saying, well, you see, these people just aren't good enough to appreciate the genius I'm giving to them. Um, when you create that kind of self-fulfilling self-fulfilling prophecy, as it were, then you are dooming yourself from the beginning. Uh, also, one reason why I try to write as little as possible for large circulation periodicals um, is some of the fan mail I get. Uh, and uh, no joke, on three separate occasions, I have been offered self-published translations of Dante by people who thought, having read heaven knows what I wrote, that I'm the only person civilized and sensitive enough to appreciate how good the, heaven help us, um, translations of Dante are. Now, when you fall, I can, I can completely sympathize with someone in that situation because it's terribly frustrating to have no audience around you, to feel that there's nobody interested in what it is you're doing. But once you close yourself off to the possibility of any audience around you, then you start this self you, you start this self-defeating cycle whereby um, there's no way in which you can create anything that can please anybody around you and you kind of want that. Um, if you uh, if you look around a lot of self-published writers and things like this, um, a lot of the time they are just yelling into the darkness and that's part of what they want. So we can't have a conception of literature that ends in that. Um, what you're saying is very true. We need to have a conception of what it is that we are creating that has the people with whom we're communicating in mind from conception. Otherwise, it's teardrops on diary pages or heaven knows what. Uh, does that answer your question roughly? Okay. 
Hi, thank you all. Can you hear me? Great. Thank you all so much for a great panel. This question's primarily for Ms. Charl and Dr. Wilson. To what extent is seeing reality well a necessary prerequisite for creating a Catholic work of art? And if it's not a necessary prerequisite, how can that be? <laughs> so uh, I don't know if you know Maritain's Art and Scholasticism, but that book is the one that provokes just that question because he begins with the artist as letting the world drop away. Uh, and the artist all on we ends at the doorway to the workshop, says he. Says he. And, and what he means by that, and, and I think this is correct, is that when an artist is ordered towards his work, he's surrendering everything else to it and to making the good work and time drops away. And that's, that's an actual experience that happens. It's one of the great joys of my life was those periods when my wife was making a lot of quiches. And so we would have uh, heavy cream in the fridge for my coffee. And so w the result of that would be that it would be five o'clock in the evening before I would actually eat because I would just be sitting at, you know, at my desk writing with the coffee with <laughs> so much so much cream in it that I never got hungry over the course of the day. It's kind of, I know it's probably how other people feel when they have heroin. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but in, built into that book is a subtle reversal of that, uh, of that um, position that this might be so for the mathematician and for the carpenter who has only to know um, the good of the equation or the good of the, the, the house being constructed. But what, um, what of the, the writer or the artist who's trying to man who's trying to compose not a servile art but a fine art that requires some kind of perception of of being uh, for Maritain, the work of fine art has is nothing other than a manifestation of of being in its self disclosure and it's giving itself away and if, if, if you have no prior contact with reality then it's going to be hard to do that but um but the thing is, we, we don't, we, I mean, we all do have contact with reality, first of all, and, and parts of it as well. Um, even John Wilmot, Earl of Rochester, who, you know, died of syphilis at age 33, had, well, I mean, I guess that proves that he had significant contact with reality. Um, <laughs> <laughs> died of it. Uh, but uh, so, so I think, you know, Artists aren't philosophers. A contact with the reality doesn't necessarily mean having a discursive knowledge of reality. It means it means having perception and and an encounter with things. And I, I, I have to say, you know, a lot of the time when I'm writing, it's I'm exploiting the the worst aspects of myself that are in visceral contact with reality and not um, necessarily the the staid guy who's sitting in his study. And so, so, uh, so I guess the answer is everybody kind of has, is already oriented thus. And may, maybe that's one more reason why talk of the imagination is not always very fruitful because it proposes that from your predisposition, you could somehow be parted from reality. Whereas in fact, you can't, it's always hitting you on the face. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. I think that was, is that helpful? Okay. No, not helpful at all. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the only thing I'll add is that the imagination, the, the, the word is image. An image doesn't exist on its own. It, it, it's, a, it's an indication of something real. So whenever we are in an imaginative space, we are invoking something that we encountered from outside of that imaginative space. So you can only create from what you've welcomed in to that space. So th I think the artist constantly needs to be um, seeking to, to know more of the real and to know th the complexities of the real um, to, to, yeah, to see how, something isn't simple and <laughs> see as many different dimensions of it as possible. I hope that's a little more clarifying. Uh, may I add to that? Um, am I on? Am I on? Yes, I am. Um, well, part of the job, uh, I think, of a literary artist or indeed of any artist is to reflect or illuminate reality. Uh, 
Um, that's, again, an important part of why this communication um, that we call literature exists in the first place. Um, does everybody here know this magnificent book, um, the best cheat sheet to literary theory there is, um, The Mirror and the Lamp by Abrams. Um, for those of you who don't know it, um, in, it's published, by, published in 1952. At Princeton University Press, b between the end of World War II and the mid 50s, had this incredible run of influential theoretical texts that aren't annoying. Um, and The Mirror and the Lamp seems to me by far the finest of these. Uh, you can use it as a cheat sheet. Uh, it's one of these books that is in itself an education. Um, you don't need to commit yourself to any particular theory of the ones that uh, are so succinctly described in that book, but it does show the basic point of what it is that we do. Um, so I was talking earlier about audiences were and the fact that literature is a communication with an audience, however you wish to conceive that, or well, why are you communicating with that audience? And it ought to be to illuminate or reflect reality in some way. And it's impossible to do that when your vision of this is when you're looking at the world through vodka goggles, as it were. All right, we'll take uh, one more and disperse in the front. Um, I was wondering if you think that self-expression has a place at art, if it has a place at all. Uh, we talked about the communion between the artist and her audience, and we've also talked about, you know, what the art is trying to signify. It, does self-expression make sense here, or is that just a sort of egoism? Or is, like, does the artist have to divorce him or herself from the art in a way in order to illuminate or reflect reality clearly? I'd say it's a tool. It's a tool. Um, obviously, you can't really look at the world through somebody else's experience. Well, you can try through imagination to look at the world through somebody else's experience, somebody, somebody else's vodka goggles, as it were. Um, but the writer who ignores his own experience in this kind of way and ignores that, that which is real, that is in him, um, can often end up producing things like something I saw at the National Gallery this afternoon. Um, I've forgotten the name of it, but it doesn't matter anyway. Um, there's a bunch of uh, 19th century pictures of, um, from the life of Joan of Arc. And um, I think we all should, let's all pretend that we celebrate that, but since nobody's nobody else is in the room, we can say they're not that good. Um, part of the reason why is that um, the artist has put in everything except himself. So they're technically quite good, these pictures. Um, they, anybody who's got an appreciation of art history can look at these and think, this very much reminds me of this picture by Paolo Uccello or whatever. Um, but the reason why something in it cloys is that um, the artist is engaging in a kind of live action role play that shuts himself out. Um, we don't appreciate, um, we, we don't say to ourselves when we go to the art gallery, I want, well, some people will say, I want to see a lot of landscapes, but I want to see a Rembrandt. I want to see a Rubens. I want to experience, I want to have the illusion that I'm touching another soul. Um, that's the role of self-expression. So it is, in fact, it's very important. It might not be an end, but it's a very important tool. Yeah, I, I, I would absolutely agree with that. To attempt to create art that is devoid of or repressive of self-expression, you, you, won't, you, you won't make anything. It won't be art. It'll be some kind of technical flourish, but it won't, it won't, capture and I, and now I'm I'm wondering why <laughs> it's an interesting question because I, I know the answer is that you must use self-expression and I wonder if it's because the self it too is part of reality it's the only part of reality that you alone have that kind of access to and so if the role of the artist is to represent reality, it's essential to, to do justice to that reality, which is yourself, 
which doesn't exist in a void, which is why you can't make the self the end, you know, the, the goal of the art. Um, I saw, I saw someone raise a microphone over here. So do you have any thoughts on that? It's a fascinating question to me. When I hear the, is this on? Yeah. When I hear the term self-expression, I usually recoil in horror. Um, <laughs> uh, but a week ago, two weeks ago, I was looking at three paintings all by a single artist and they were, each of them was stunning. One was a representation of Christ on the road to Emmaus, and it was done in a sort of dark, somber, autumnal style that, rem that would remind most of us of a 19th century landscape. Um, another was the wedding at Cana that had St. Peter's in the background, and it was done in these bright colors that looked very similar to 18th century, you know, neoclassical painting, uh, um, not Poussin, but anyhow, anyhow, I'll just leave it there because I, I can't quite, I couldn't quite get, get the artist it was, it was, it was trying to remind me of. And then the middle was this incredible, of these three paintings, was this incredible image of the Holy Family that had the, the muscular motion of the family, the way they were moving, almost orbiting each other on the canvas of um, Botticelli. Each of them was an incredible work individually. And someone who may have been like the devil whispering in my ear or just making an innocent comment said, you could look at these three and say they were by three different people. And I went, <gasps> I didn't say anything. I just, I was just horrified because that struck me as that was something wrong with that. I'm, you know, you've heard enough f from T.S. Eliot by way of me tonight. I, at least I thought you did, but I'm going to offer just one more observation. He's famous for his... Uh, wonderful remark, um, poetry is not an expression of an emotion, but an escape from emotion. Poetry is not an expression of personality, but an escape from personality, which is then completed by the following parenthesis. But only those who have emotions and personality know what it means to desire to escape from those things. That's the most important part of the sentence. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, he also said of Shakespeare, or sorry, what are you talking about that every poet is the author of exactly one more poem than the sum total of poems he has written. And that is the poem of all the works together. And I think that that's true. Um, that to read W.H. Auden or Thomas Hardy, who, you know, both wrote a lot of poems, um, or to read Shakespeare also, uh, to, to read each of the individual works, you are, you can't help, the imagination can't help but build towards some sort of vision of the whole that, that, that holds it all together. And maybe that's self-expression, or maybe that too is a creation of the artist. Um, but it is a kind of presentation of a self that, that transcends the individual works. All right, well, thank you again so much. Real quick, real quick um, thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, thanks to my student for the final question. Thanks to my students for coming. Uh, and excellent job. Thank you all. It was a great panel. Uh, join us with, uh, for some reception. Thank you.